is punishable for 10 years imprisonment to be gay. It's annoying every Nigerian have the right to party. So why should these guys be arrested? Because they will perceive sexuality. I came to the US with one bag, no one friend. Nobody is free until all of us are free. I feel guilty because I have people back home who cannot have this that I'm having. That country is a waste of time. Just leave it behind. On Sunday, intelligence arrested 57 homosexual youths. Someone died there. Someone died. It's about being able to make a change and make a difference. So going to Nigeria is something I need to do. We have a community that is shown how to survive by themselves. The definition of a gay is when you are caught having sexual intercourse with a guy and they didn't caught me. The whole world is watching me, so do your worst. For Nigeria, is we fear what we don't know. When are we going to welcome all this? Nigeria doesn't go to This is the time for change. I want to encourage billions and zillions of people, telling them that you have rights. Do you know why? Because you're human. Hello and welcome. My name is Kamali Powell, and I'm the executive director of Rainbow Railroad. We're an international-based organization in Canada and the United States with the goal of helping LGBTQI people who are facing persecution find pathways to safety. And I'm thrilled to be here to moderate this conversation around the powerful film, The Legend of the Underground. I'm joined by the directors as well as a couple of special guests. Let's get right into it. First, Giselle, Giselle Bailey, Nako Nora, congratulations on the film. What a powerful film that really touches on an important topic. Congratulations to you both. Thank, Thank you, you so much. Thank you. So let's talk about this film. First, how did it come about? What inspired you to make The Legend of the Underground? Well, there was like a plethora of things in this case. Um, there's two parts to it. There's the part in uh, New York City and there's a the part in Nigeria. Uh, for the New York City part, um, I was actually at a New York City Pride Parade um, where as I was walking, I saw a float behind me and there was a Nigerian flag. I had never, ever seen a rainbow flag and a Nigerian flag in the same vicinity before. Uh, my dad is Nigerian. Uh, he's Igbo from a number state. And so I grew up around a lot of my Nigerian family in the U.S. And so seeing that, like, just stole my heart. Michael was there um, behind me dancing with his friend Abraham and a group of other people. And the rest of that Pride March, I walked with them and it felt like I found family um, in my Nigerian side, which I never, and, and the whole queer side as well. I had never seen those two together. Um, cut fast forward to, I was at an Ethiopian restaurant in Harlem and I was eating, I was about to check out. Um, and the waiter there to me says, your name is Naka? That's a Nigerian name. Um, and I was like, yeah, I said, but I can't go back there because I'm a lesbian. And he was like, he was like, I can't go back there either because I'm here to seek asylum. Um, and so he was like, there's actually going to be a party this evening. I would love for you to come. And so I went to that party. And at that party was also Michael, who I had seen at the Pride Parade, and like 60 other Nigerians who had come to the U.S. to seek asylum. And they were partying. They were eating Nigerian food. They were so welcoming. There was so much energy, dancing, like every everything. It was like the best feeling in the world. And so I had realized there was a whole community of boys here um, that were going through something deeply. Cut to about a year later, Giselle Bailey and I worked on a project together called My House. And it was about the Vogue um, underground ballroom scene in New York City. Um, you know, what happened 25 years after Paris is burning. And we worked so well, synergistically, creatively, like creative soulmates. And we were like, we want to do something beyond the New York City ballroom scene. We want to actually create something that tells a story about people of the diaspora, her being Jamaican and myself being Nigerian. And so Giselle made the beautiful suggestion <laughs> that we do Nigeria. And that scared the shit out of me because I'm like, my dad, my dad is Nigerian. Like my family's Nigerian. I, I don't, they don't like that over there. It's like um, illegal. So I was like, we can't, like, we can't, there's no way we can do this. And then we're both Aries, so we did it anyway. And then there's the part where James came into play. The film was going to be about 
New asylum seekers in New York who had come from Nigeria and them establishing their lives here. But then I seen James Brown on a video 50 Cent reposted. And I was like, who is this kid? He's like so tenacious. He's so brave. Yeah. He's so powerful. And we were like, we have to get James a part of this film. And we realized that because people were being arrested out there, we needed to be able to tell the full story of these boys who come from Nigeria but are experiencing uh, hatred, discrimination, all of those things. And so that was part of like what sparked us doing a Giselle King elaborate further. I mean, I think you described it beautifully. I know that when Neka connected me with Michael and a lot of people, um, the 2A girls, I felt really connected because I did not come here seeking asylum, but I am an immigrant to the United States and my family left Jamaica because of the violence that was happening there. So it felt, um, I felt akin because I really, in some ways, understand what it feels like to kind of be ripped out of your culture your extended family, your life, and start new in a completely different place. And I wanted to tell that story. And I think also, as someone who's left their home country, you always fantasize about what it would be like to go back or what it would be like if you could have stayed. And so I thought it was really powerful, Michael, going back to Nigeria and seeing the complexity, the emotional complexity of what that experience is like. What a powerful connection. Uh, and I wonder um, what it meant for your own identity, uh, Neka, and, uh, you know, as a lesbian, as someone from the diaspora, to connect with this film on a personal level. Uh, how, did that, how did that affect the process? It affected the process deeply for me. I was scared. Um, I had a anxiety attacks filming the whole entire time. There's a couple things you think about, which is the safety of the people who are filming. Um, you want to make sure there has there's a lot of strategy put in to make sure while you're filming that the people stay safe while cameras are on them. We strategized around, you know, um, how we shot it. But as I personally, in terms of my identity, I, I didn't even tell my father that I went to Nigeria to shoot this film because I was fearful that, you know, he would not speak to me Um as I, you know, as I was shooting the film. So I didn't tell him I was afraid of that. And then I present as a masculine presenting halfway woman. And so what would the reaction be to me as a masculine woman in Nigeria? Um, and so that was, that was kind of, um, you know, unsettling as well. So Michael, let's come to you. What made you decide to trust uh, Neka and Giselle and agree to be filmed? Hi, um, I think prior to meeting Nika and Giselle, um, I had done a couple of interviews like YouTube, uh, movies, you know, about LGBT rights in Africa. And I just thought it was from always from a white perspective. And those like white students from Colombia or from like, you know, trying to do a subject matter on LGBT Africans and they make me their subject matter. So I've done a couple of those and I was just also like tired, you know, of telling my story from that perspective and not from my own way and not from, you know, from an African perspective that someone actually understands the issue. And when I met, before I met them, I've stopped. I'm like, for a year, I didn't do any interviews because I just thought like, if you want to know about me, you can just Google and you fell off articles or videos to, to, to you know, to talk about. So, and I met Nicker and Giselle, I'm like, oh my God. And like, they were so passionate about the kind of story they wanted to tell. And um, what convinced me was that it wasn't from a sad perspective. Like, you know, we know there are sad issues happening in the continent, but also we know that we are beautiful people. Like, you know, we are amazing, fashionable people and, you know, dancers and talented people and who just happen to be gay and be discriminated against. So the perspective they wanted to talk, the, tell the story about convinced me. Um, and I just said it was the right time, you know, it was the right time to tell our stories in a big way and a huge, huge platform and for people to see us, they will want to be seen. Um, that was really important. One of many powerful clips within the film, uh, for me, uh, I'm sure for many people watching, was the moment that you decided to return to Nigeria. Uh, take a look. I can't help but like, want to ask this question. It's been years and years and years you've been away. Like, I mean, what was the motive behind this visit? 
I'm in a space where I, right now, I'm just taking time to learn. Like, I'm learning a lot about, you know, I, the community I thought I knew very well. And, you know, being in Nigeria also enables me to see things differently. And to make me a better advocate, you know, seeing someone like James, the, the resilience that he's showing, the positivity that he's showing through the way he carries himself, through the work that he does, through people who get inspired by him. He might not know it, but millions of people get inspired by just James being James. And how do we make sure people like that get the support that they need? That is what I'm interested in. Michael, what led you to claim asylum in the United States? And what point did you feel safe returning to Nigeria? You know, I think it's it's a lot for me, you know, what before when I was in Nigeria, I was working with an LGBT organization. Um, and the reason why I started working for the organization was because like there was no other thing. Like it was it was out of survival, you know, with my friends back in Nigeria, we we're trying to survive and we created an organization that catered for us and our friends. And I was working for the organization. They became home and family for me. Um, and, you know, it, it turned into, like, many LGBT organizations. It turned into an HIV organization because, like, that's the only way you get funded to, to do the work that you do and to create safe spaces for people. So I wrote an abstract about, you know, about the work I was doing in Nigeria that got accepted at the AIDS conference in Washington, D.C., 2012. And I came to the conference to present my work. Um, and then... An article from Huffington Post came out after that, and I had to go to Nigeria. I was attacked, just in summary. And the decision to leave Nigeria was a decision that, that I had to make for myself. I think it was made for me by other people because it was about like life and death. I did not have the chance to even make the decision for myself. And that's the most painful part. Like, you know, that decision was taken out of me that I couldn't make a decision. I could have decided to leave Nigeria to go to, to come here, to live a happy life, get married, you know, have fun and all of those things, but I had to live for my life. And that's just a lot of gay people have to make in countries where they're discriminated against or where their lives are at risk. And I think, you know, and I come in here and I find out that I'm not just gay, I'm also a black man, right? Back in Nigeria, I had to live with my sexuality as a gay man and that, you know, people had to discriminate me for that. And then moving to the state, I had to realize, oh, you're not just gay, you're also a black man. Where being black here is another factor you have to like, you know, realize and know what that means for yourself. And you're also Nigerian and you have a thick accent. So all of those things come with several identity issues I had to like face. And I think for me, what was important was to create a home for myself here. Uh, I think, you know, when I came here newly, the people that I knew here were all white men, amazing people, like white friends of mine who I knew as founders back in Nigeria. And when I came here, they were kind of people that I kind of, you know, grew closer to. But I decided to find out, like, there was no space for queer Nigerians who were Black who moved here to sort of connect together. And my apartment became this place where all Nigerians, if you come to New York newly, you have nowhere to stay, you can stay with us. Um, we moved from the Bronx to Brooklyn, so Staten Island, and then to Harlem. And all of those processes were people that are Nigerians that are queer, and those were safe spaces we had we created for ourselves. And those spaces were family, and those spaces make us free. And we, we made the choice, this one now, we made the choice to create that space for ourselves. We didn't have the choice to move here, but we made the choice to create a safe space for ourselves right here in New York City. Um, yeah. So many people would, would hear that and say, you've created identity on your own terms. Why return? Why go back to Nigeria? And, and I'll say that as noting, uh, I think, two things that strike me from what you just said. One is how quickly someone can be displaced. I think that's really important to understand that your life gets uprooted in a moment. And the decision to claim asylum is instant. But also, you know, and it's certainly something that we find in our work at Rainbow Railroad, just how... Uh, how hard it is for human rights defenders to make that decision to flee because you're dedicated your life to trying to protect and promote people at home in Nigeria. So in the face of all that, what was that moment like to return? What led you to say yes? You know, prior to that, I had just reconnected with my family, you know, for 12 years, I hadn't spoken with them uh, straight. And, you know, because of, because of your sexual, because of my uh, sexual education, education, yeah. Yeah. So I left my parents when I was 14. Um, and I've lived by myself ever since then. So I came to the U.S. even after that. Um, so, you know, and my dad passed away. 
um, before I passed away, we, we reconnected, you know, and I made the decision to go back to Nigeria. Uh, first of all, to like, you know, connect with my family. And then secondly, to like see, because things were changing online with like new activists and people who are not conforming to this to the structure activism way that we like you have to have an NGO, you have to walk through this process. There were young Nigerians who were breaking barriers without being connected to the movement. And I, I, I was really intrigued by that. I wanted to learn more. I'm like, these young people who are changing the space, who are owning the space without being connected to a structure or without being part of an organization and making a difference that we, that call ourselves, you know, the activists, are not able to do it the same way. So I was re- literally intrigued by that. And I wanted to learn more and find out more about that process and those people. And also, like, just to go back to Nigeria. And a big factor also was my best friend. Uh, who, who is in the film, who was back in Nigeria. I haven't seen him for years. And, you know, I really wanted to see him so badly. And I was really planning to go to Lagos either way, with or without the film already, to go see him and to see the movement and to see my parents. So, yeah, I had, I made the decision to go back, knowing the risk. And then when Ineka and Giselle came up with the film, I'm like, you know, it's perfect timing. Like, this couldn't be the perfect timing. Like, I had a reason to go back to Nigeria before, but... So, but the, but also I, I get to go to Nigeria in a big way, right? To go tell my story and to to go to the stories of other people who are on the ground. There's a really uh, moving scene uh, when you arrive at the airport to see your best friend. Uh, why don't we take a quick look? Hello. <laughs> Why you do that? No. No. Oh my God! <laughs> I hate you. <laughs> oh my God! Look at you! Look at you! Why can you be okay? See me so stuttering so like no man's business. Wow. Seven years. Or I was more on the plane. I was years. looking. I was looking down. Like I haven't been back here for so long. I love the whole hoodie stuff. <laughs> I was trying to disguise. <laughs> I know. <laughs> Where's the shade? <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, oh, I'm gonna call me this guy. So. <laughs> but you, you really don't look like you, like you look very different. Yeah, that's what I was trying to do. But you know, I'm here now. <laughs> Welcome back. Finally. Like with the capital F, finally. <laughs> Giselle and Neka, tell tell us a little bit about that moment. That moment of, you know, capturing uh someone who's living in Nigeria as a uh LGBTQI person, uh and almost this cloak and dagger way by which Michael reunited with them at the airport. Well, it would I mean I think we ended up all in tears because we went uh, to Nigeria ahead of Michael. So we were with his best friend, ID, who is also best friends to a lot of the um, people who now live in Nigeria, including uh, in America, including Deji. So we've heard about ID. We've talked to ID on the phone. I, he was one of the first people they had connected me to when they were saying, you know, you should meet some more people in Nigeria. When we're talking about doing the film. Um, and so we got to to meet him. Um, He actually wasn't doing that well. He was a bit ill at the time. Um, So we were seeing that for the first time in person. And at the same time, he had so many beautiful things to say about Michael, about Deji. And we started filming him and he's just talking about all these beautiful memories, the house that they had established together, the family they had established together, all these things that they went through and how I guess seven years, eight years prior, he had been taking the same trip to drop Michael off to the airport to leave the country. And now he was going back to see him. So by the time he pulled up, uh, you know, we jumped out and had got into another car and then he pulled up and Michael got in. It was just, you know, so, so profound. And it was a last minute decision too. Uh, we, you know, as documentarians, we don't know how things are always going to go. But we were sitting in a restaurant with ID and just hearing the stories and stuff like that. And we was like, yo, we should surprise Michael. Like, 
Michael had no clue ID was going to be at the airport. And ID at some point didn't even have an idea he was going to go to the airport at first. And then we were all talking at uh, lunch before Michael arrived. And he thought it would be, you know, a good idea to meet Michael at the airport. So Michael kept calling. So ID kept having to make up things. So Michael didn't know, like, where he was. But we got two hours of footage almost of just ID stories on them. We weren't able to use all of them in the film, but it was so beautiful. And, and we're so glad we captured the moment because um, life is precious. And that's the beautiful thing about these things is that now we have a forever memory of ID um, and Michael and uh, everybody can't have those moments. A lot of times when people leave their country, they don't see their family. Family passes away. They can never see them again. Tell us a little bit more about how you found James in this film. I'm very passionate about the James Brown topic. Mr. They Didn't Caught Me, uh, the diva, the the most courageous person I've ever met in my entire life. Like, I've never, ever, 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 ever met a person who just gives no fucks what people think. And I felt like James was, like, going to be one of the biggest uh, icons of the Nigerian community because of that voice, um, that unapologetic voice. And he took a risk. And sometimes people don't understand that uh, revolutions, things changing happen because someone says, no, we're not, we're not having that. I didn't do anything wrong. And so that's where um, James' inspiration came from. And then when we got to Nigeria, there was already a producer we had on that lived in Nigeria on the ground. She interviewed Ni um, James first. So James, talk about that moment when you stood up to those police officers. A definition of a gay is when you are caught having sex, child intercourse with a guy, and they didn't cut me. Did they cut me? Ask the policeman, did they cut me? I guess I have two questions about that. One, what caused you to stand up to the police officer? And I guess the second question, did you know you were being recorded? I don't remember those police who were really, really harassing me. Not just me, I mean, it's what to say, 57 of us. We have 57, actually. So I don't know they were really harassing me, doing something. I was the, from the beginning of the whole thing, I was the one that was asking questions. I mean, because I am more of a law student. So I went into law because of the old Nigeria shipping of, shipping of our institution. So that was reason, that was really what prompted me to, to read about law, my rights, civil defense, and so many other things. So because I knew that I've been harassed several times and I'm tired. The last time I met my dad, he was strong in the health industry whereby I had some connections to the top. So it, it gave me that little background that, okay, I have my dad and I have that little power from my dad's part. So I am touchable, but still, if I can have some sources in it, it will look as if I am untouchable. You can say. So, and I was born an actor. So most times I have to act my way. Even though I'm not really, really strong at that moment, I have to act it. Because I felt like if I just speak out, something will change. Because the truth is, if I don't, nobody will. People are so scared. I don't know what you're scared of. Is it death? Is it human being? Is it the money? Is it the power? Because all the things are in vain. I was, I was so, I was so strong at that moment because I was nobody. Why? Because I had nothing to protect. The only thing I cared about was my dad. But I felt like I had nobody. I had nothing to protect really. So I was invisible. So they were, it was a country, it's, it's a body, it's a generation. I can destroy them by literally saying one thing that can really destroy the whole system. Actually, just take us somewhere from US or UK and the, the system will crash down into pieces. It's just one word, literally just one word. So yeah, that's my belief. It's a fantasy I create in my head that word is the most powerful thing in the world. So that's why. Um, let me ask you another question. James Brown, where did that come from? Why I gave myself James Brown was, yeah, I was inspired by the last long living my great 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 grandfather James Brown, the musicians, after reading the stories. And I found out that I had a lot of talent. I am a spoken, I'm confident, I can dance, I can have. At some point, I can compose songs. So all talent put together were like wasting out there. There was no way to express, no platform to express it. So James Brown was like a, 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 a utter ego I have to put on to, to become myself. That was, that became my authentic self. Ever since I put on James Brown, I was like, the same design I became famous. I have been so bold and so outspoken and so 
I mean, and so that bad bitch boss lady attitude has been me and you get. So James Brown was like a profession and it was a blessing in this guy. And of course, your viral sensation. Uh, Michael, I wonder uh, what it was like for you to meet James. I'm not sure if you knew about James before you arrived, but I think Neka and Giselle and everyone, you know, joined in this conversation. I think the film really hit some really it, like powerful moments around coming home. Michael, I, I wonder about starting with you. What was your objective once you arrived in meeting people like James, like reconnecting with uh, activists, LGBTQI people in Nigeria? And I I'm really thinking particularly around some of the moments in the community center when people gathered and uh, over that really powerful scene at dinner. I'm really grateful and to see you guys and to meet some of these people I admire a lot. Like, they were late, like, you know, admire from, from afar. If you guys, a little secret about the like, I was there late for Halloween, this past Halloween. So I dressed yes, like they were late. Oh, like, that's from so Halloween. Yeah. Oh. So, so um, wait, now, be, be very, did you sacrifice comfort for fashion? How did well, you, did what, what were your feet like, like at the I'm end of also the day. like a very fashionable person. Like, yeah, but your feet must have hurt. Oh yeah, it hurts a lot. I was walking in Times Square without heels. No, but so, it's yeah. easy to walk yeah. in Times Square in heels. No, no. But I don't want to try that in Balogu Market. Oh shit, baby. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so <laughs> what comes to our reality check? <laughs> Come on, oh, yeah. walk a mile in our shoes here. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I want to know like I'm Nigerian. <laughs> It doesn't matter if I've, if I've been away for 10 years, 20 years. Like, I would never take that away from myself because I knew what I went through when I was here. I said, it's part of my story. It's part of who I am. It has made me who I am today. So taking that back, it's really important to me. So cheers to be Nigerian. Cheers to Nigeria. Raise your glasses, everyone, and cheers to be Nigerian. If you can survive in Nigeria, you can survive anywhere else in the world. I think for me, I think maybe the any kind of might not know this. I think in a way they told my story through the eyes of so many people, right? I think especially mm -hmm. for James, you know, like the reason why I left Nigeria was because I was outed and you know my news came out and I had to leave Nigeria for that. I think and then the asylum situation and then you know Emmanuel was talking about his HIV status. So I th and I think it's just like in my way, I, I could see myself in James. I could see myself in EJ, in Deji. I could see myself in Edafe. I could see myself you know, in, in Manuel, because these people were literally living the lives that I left, that I left back in Nigeria, or still living. And which is so unique and important because I don't think they did that, you know, purposely. It just happened to be the situation. And I think for, for James particularly, I was so inspired by James before I ever met him. Like, I saw the news and, you know, my roommates, some of them were laughing about, who is this guy? I'm like, no, this guy is really like, what he's saying is actually factual. He's actually stating the law that you did not catch me or did not caught me. Let me reframe James, like having sex with other men, because that's what the law said. You have to be caught having sex with a man before you can be persecuted based on the law. So it was actually questioning the law. And that was so unique because people don't normally question that. When police arrest you, you flee. And then the same thing for me, you know, I questioned authorities in Nigeria. I spoke about like living, being a gay man and my HIV status and I questioned situations back in Nigeria. So I think I could see myself in James. I got so inspired by James. I'm like, can you imagine you have no support? You have no NGO backing you, but you're able to speak like this on your own. Imagine the power you have if more people can see you and hear what you have to share and the world will be in your hands, literally. So I got inspired by James. And I think what one that was that also got really, uh, that was so very important for me was Emmanuel. Because back in Nigeria, you know, when you were gay and when you're HIV positive, like when you're gay, you get accepted by your gay friends, right? And when you're HIV positive, you lose those gay friends because nobody wants to be associated with someone living with HIV. And in Nigeria, it's so like, because the, the, where you go for care, it's so open. Everyone knows you're HIV positive. There's nowhere to hide. And then for him losing his family and church, that that, it, that matters to him, you know, I could relate to that. So I think, you know, for me, it was like, you know, going to that community center, because back in Nigeria, I was a, I was a peer educator, right? I did testing for people, for gay men living with HIV. I mean, tested gay men at parties. So on a, on a normal day, I would test six, seven gay men, and at least five of them would turn positive 
And sometimes I have to be the one to break the news to them, right? So like recreating that community center was a community center that I've seen before, that I've gone through before, that I can, I've yet to stories for. They have nowhere to go. You know, I'm HIV positive or like my parents drove me out of the house. And we have to be there for each other because we know out there in the street, there's nobody who's going to be there for you. This space we have right now that is protected by the way is where we have for ourselves. So I think for me, it was like unique in the sense like I had to see people <laughs> that lived my life. And I'm still, I'm not 40, you know? Yeah. Yeah. And James, I wonder what was it like to meet Michael uh, and have him be uh, in Nigeria m meeting you and other people? Yeah, uh, it was so inspiring because I've heard a lot about Michael and I was like, I, I was, it was really intriguing. Michael was quite understanding. And that was actually the first time someone was actually understanding me. Because I'm very, I'm like a max. You can't, it can hardly stop me. I, like, you know, my flash, you could, Michael could live read through me. He knew the story. When I told Michael, I didn't really tell my whole full story on the screen. I asked so many stories that Inika and I and Michael tapped behind the screen. So, like, those stories were the, what made James Brown powerful. Like, what made James Brown extremely confident. Because without those stories, they won't be confident. They won't be James Brown. So the, the, the journey towards James Brown, Michael could really understand it. And for that, it was like my elder brother in this guy. He even knew that, you know what I'm saying? So, hi, Michael. Hope you. So it was really beautiful meeting Michael. And, and it was really connecting because he could understand it. He understand the struggle. It's like someone that has passed through it, that's ready to help. You get? And that was the first time I'm seeing it. I mean, literally, in Nigeria. Yeah. And, and Neka and Giselle, one of the scenes that for me were so rich and complex and put together numerous threads was, um, I think you, you called it the elites, uh, the section of the film where, you know, Michael gathered with different, uh, different members of the Nigerian LGBTQ community. I think it's one of the hardest things sometimes people understand in the context of forced displacement and this work. How can someone like Michael be forced to flee at an instant. I think Michael gave a good example of that person who came out, who was outed uh, for being HIV positive, all of a sudden gets kicked out of their home, loses family or community, might be forced to flee. But on the other hand, you have people who are able to live, live well. And I think the underlying difference is around wealth and access to resources. I wonder if you could talk a little bit about um, the dynamics between James and Michael and and the people in that moment of the film. Yeah, well, first, like, one, what I wanted to add to what uh, James and Michael were saying, what's so powerful about what James actually said when he said, you didn't catch me in any act, it's about the assumption that people are LGBTQ because they're feminine and everybody does not identify that way in this film. Some people are nonconformists. Some people are, you know, people identify numerous amounts of ways, but it's not always, um, the way they identify is not always LGBTQ. So I just wanted to make that distinction is that that was the point is that you can't really just judge a book by its cover and people have the freedom to express themselves in their full fluidity beyond having to have a label on, or a title on it. And I think this film wasn't even about sexuality. Um, it was really about gender expression or freedom of self-expression regardless of how you identify so or how, I just, or how you perceived um so i just wanted to throw that out there because everyone in the in the film may not identify as a gay male then um also in terms of the status nigerians like money okay like we we like money and we respect money it, it's with the <laughs> it's with the culture literally a part of my Igbo family upbringing we dance we throw money on your head, the money falls to the ground, we pick it up. That's a part of our celebration and that's a part of the culture. And so when we went there, Timmy actually broke down the different classes because we're like in the ballroom scene here, we have like House of Ebony, House of This, House of That. Um, so how does how is everything structured in Nigeria? And Timmy told us that it was broken down by social status. So you had the elites, you had the Razites, the Ratchetees, and different... Um, socioeconomic classes and so uh 
without trying to label everyone elites, what we were trying to communicate quickly is that there's a group of people who are more so have jobs, maybe big on social media. They're thriving. They're working. They're live. They might be living on some different parts, but they might not live on the mainland. They might live on the island, which is a more wealthy part of uh, the the area and the city in Lagos. And so um, we really uh, wanted to show like, okay, when you have a community and you're coming together, you have to pull resources from somewhere. You can't pull it from the government. You can't pull it from your parents if your parents are not around. Uh, if everyone's indifferent about your presentation, that's not going to be so easy. So who can people who have less in the community actually go to? And so I think Michael found that the people who did have access to NGOs, that did have access to money from working, hosting shows, different things like that, or come from wealthy families and government and stuff like that, maybe they could help uh, people who are part of their community one way or another to maybe help um, them out of this situation that they were in. And so um, that description of the different classes, I think, was so key and so important um, to help people understand how the structure socially and culturally works um, within this community in Nigeria. And I also think that that structure is at play in many other parts of the world, including the United States. And one other thing um, I wanted to say is that while people with more financial capital can maybe buy more security just in some ways um, and privacy, um, I think so many times we see throughout history, it's like the revolutionaries, the people who speak out, the, the artists that are the ones who make the way for the rest of the community. And I think we'll really see that through James' story. Another striking part of the film was listening to the opportunities for people in Nigeria to express themselves. Uh, and they did so through podcaster and broadcaster, Timmy. Uh, Timmy, talk a little bit about the space you provide for LGBTQI plus folks in Nigeria. Okay, so one thing I tell people about the work I do is um, I'd, I'd, I'd had the early exposure to being in the underground scene at a very tender age of 15, 16. I'd had the privilege of being there. And every time I get into that space, I do not see myself. I do not get to learn. I don't. There were no materials for me to learn about my queerness. It was just, we all were just young people coming here to just exist. It's like a safe space to exist in real time. And I needed to take away that, um, I needed to take away whatever that real time is giving us to people who can't come to the real time. I needed to give us representation in where we could not get representation from. And that's what I do with the podcast. Literally just document our time, get people there to tell their own stories. I can tell your story because... In as much as we are queer Nigerians, we all have individual um, stories, we all have individual journeys, we've got privileges that make our, our stories different, we've got experiences that makes our stories unique, right? So I create platforms for everybody. Come and tell your story. Everybody, just come and tell your story. Let the world hear you. Let the world hear you. Let the world know what is going on. And that's just what I do on my platform. I'm having with me the persons that were arrested in August 2018 at a party in Kelly and Egbeda, Lagos, who are alleged with homosexuality. The story was not just your our story. It wasn't your street story. It wasn't your state story. It was a national and international story. And what led you to agree to participate in this film? It's a thing for us to pull out queer content in Nigeria, right? It's another thing for us to be able to tell the world what is going on in Nigeria. What the world perceives of the Nigerian LGBTIQ community is totally different from our reality. Until lately, thanks to social media, that we are getting to put our faces to our stories out there. Now people can pinpoint that, okay, if I don't know what is going on in Nigeria, I know this person who is in Nigeria and is queer and they're going through this. If I don't know anybody in Nigeria, I know that person. So... Literally, and that's the beauty. That was what got me there on the movie. Like, okay, you know what? This is an opportunity for us to tell the world. It's a big opportunity to tell the world what's going on. That's it. Two final questions. 
I'm gonna ask everyone to answer. I'll start with you, Michael. Uh, to what do you want people to take away from watching this film and for the people who are listening to this conversation? Well, I think, you know, people have always seen the queer community, the non-conformist community in Nigeria one way. And I hope that this film gives them a broad spectrum of what it is to be queer, what it is to be non-conformist, and what, what is the situation right now in the country. Because people, a lot of, you know, People in America, you know, people across the globe always seems to have a perception about what it is to be part of the community in Nigeria. And this film actually exploits that and shows the real reality of people that, you know, it's not just one way fits all. People have different things, different identities, different ways they want to, you know, show themselves and be part of the community. And this film actually does that. And also that there are real situations in Nigeria that are happening right now that, you know, that are, in, that, that are you know, impacting the community, the LGBT community in Nigeria. And I hope that people see that and people support that and, you know, help amplify the situations of the country, the organizations who are working in the country to be to to help, you know, uh, the movement in the country. And I hope people see that. I just want to say one more thing about, you know, the the elite situation. I think, you know, I was never I was James in Nigeria, like I was never part of the elites. And, you know, I, w I didn't I didn't get invited to the elites <laughs> clubs or what it is because I wasn't opportunity to be part of it. Um, so, you know, be able to live in both worlds now, because I still feel myself, I can still like relate to what James was in Nigeria. Not anymore. I think she's a big girl now, um, <laughs> but, but, but like, you know, but before then, you know, I, I could relate to it. So I think, you know, it's, it's, it's not always one size fits all, right? It's not always where you see people that people actually portray themselves. People like have different identities and they're like, like I said earlier, they are 35 LGBT organizations who are working with the community in Nigeria. Find them, support them, be part of the movement, and you know, find ways to amplify their voices. Same question, James. What do you want people watching the film and this conversation to leave with? I just want connection. I just want love. I want. Um, I don't really know about the elite stuff, the elite bigger class. I know about that as a middle class, higher class, middle class, and I started. I mean, from nothing. So I just want that swift connection from the nobody to somebody. She gets so I that's what made me start my James Brown Foundation. It registered, I mean government registered everything under the administration of human rights activists so that I can be able to pull fifty percent of it to LGBT. Because Nigeria does not accept other things. So we are using that. I want I want the movie, I want people to I want the LGBT community to know that I am here for you. I want you to understand that I can understand your pain, your struggle, and I want to, I want to, I don't know how I would do that. I want to impact courage and confidence to people because God, everybody, Nigeria needs this. You don't have to be rich or poor, you just have to stand your ground. So, so out there, we reach out to you. That just That's really clear and really powerful. Neka, Giselle, same question. Um, I, I really want people to see themselves because a lot of times if you don't have visibility, you feel powerless, you feel not good about yourself, you feel demonic. And there, we wanted uh, everyone to be able to see the beauty of themselves. They're not alone. There's not no one else, like how I thought before I met Michael. Um, there are more like you, there's more like us. And I think that visibility, we can't continue to expand and grow if we're not visible. Um, and if people continue to have this like mystical idea of what a person who's gender non-conforming is like. And I think that at the end of the day, everyone wants love, everyone wants connection, everybody wants family. And I think that at the end of the day, we need to see um, how we could build that. And we want this film to be an example, a guide on how to find self-love. And that's the goal ultimately, is that a, a guide for self-love um, for generations and generations to come, because this is just the only very, very beginning. So imagine 20 years from now, when people have this film to look at, or 60 years from now, when they're like, there was this boy named James Brown, and he spoke out about the police. People are going to say it all started from that moment in their head, you know what I mean, from, right. from this. And so this, I think this is going to be like a, a, a cultural historical piece um, years and years. It's going to just get more fine with age, I believe. And Michael as well, um, uh, his heroic movement and bringing everyone together here has been like 
super powerful and life-changing for all of us. And so I can't wait for the world to see the first icons of the civil rights movement, essentially, um, in Nigeria. So I'm, we're both honored to be a part of it yeah. and humbled that everyone was so open and willing to share their stories. And we hope that they are also they also feel protected and loved throughout the process because we're going to be here every single uh, step of the way. And I think, Michael, what's really powerful about what you've done, along with Nathan Nuzel, is make a call to action. Um, you know, people who are watching this movie can support James, they can support organizations in Nigeria who are building safe spaces. You can find out more online. Uh, that's a key part of this is that the movement building can happen after the film. And one last final question is to you, James. You know, one of the concerns of Rainbow Railroad and I know of Michael's and the filmmakers is around safety and your safety. And we're really uh, pleased at Rainbow Railroad to do a small part in trying to find safe haven for those who might be affected. But do you feel, um, we know that there's been a, a little bit of stir in the Nigerian community because of this film. Do you feel safe currently? And do you uh, do the community around you feel safe? I think I will speak for not just myself, for everybody in the movie. When that documentary came out, I mean, the, the trailer, close to 10 people that feel were shaking on the phone, telling me I should shut that down. I said, it's not in my place. I'm just literally, you know, even though I'm rich, I'm more of like the star there, but I'm not the owner of it. It's HBO. So yeah, they were shaking, saying, James, I'm not ready to become out there. I don't want to be out there. I don't know. I think, and I don't know how you guys would do it. You have to reach out to each of them because they are really scared. I mean, they are deadly scared. I to scare. I can protect myself. What? With the, with the link a little bit, I, I can protect myself. But the truth is, I can't protect everybody. Um, I'm just trying to work um, my, with my brain and myself and my connection around the clock to get a safe place in Nigeria with the government. I mean, you know how this politician works, money and uh, pleasure. I'm just trying to like, create that opportunity down here in Nigeria. And I'm still working with me because Michael is actually helping me out back to back. Nika has been very, very busy. So I'm still trying to like work around so I can help people. Yeah, I don't want people to suffer like I do. She gets so but people that are really future in this movie, I don't know. I think you just need to reach out to them or something because they're really scared. And if anybody comes to me, I'm gonna like switch up my phone and block other people. Because trust me, I also gonna pass through my own. Because it's because I'm a star already, so people think me are just a normal project. But those people that are not a star uncle, they will go and feed themselves. Oh. We just said in real truth. This is Nigeria we're talking about here. Yeah. Imagine while the country can ban Twitter. We are close to the ban I think I think that's what makes them so brave, everyone who agreed to do this film, was just that. The willingness. They are not brave, bro. Sorry. They are not brave. Some are not brave, bro. Some just thought it's just... So, so. No, we didn't is that. When they were doing it, they were, like, they were so excited, having fun with it. Michael was there. Like, I'm sure you see the excitement, you're like, oh my God, I didn't know it would become a big deal. <laughs> this is old. So, Nick, I'm sure you understand, but they sign a lot of things, yeah. But I just don't, maybe you should reach out to them or something, because a lot of them are really scared and they are really pissing me off because I have so many jobs to pissing me off. I should just add that we are so actually doing that. Like, we are reaching out to the people on the ground okay. and we have a program in place. We have organizations in Lagos who are working with them. But if people reach out to you, you can direct them to me directly. All right, thank you. Just let me know, because we have a program in place. Yeah, yeah. And we have ah, something in place right now. Yeah. I think that's what makes this project so powerful is, you know, visibility is key. Like you said it earlier. And with visibility comes exposure. With exposure comes risk. Uh, and so, Michael, your willingness to, you know, keep the conversation going, to allow spaces for people to exist is, is really important. So, Nika and Giselle, I'll let you have the last word. Uh, any closing thoughts? Uh, again, congratulations on a really powerful film. It moved me. I know it moved any, everyone watching it. Yeah, the last thoughts, we're just really proud and humbled to be able to tell Michael's story, James Brown's story, ID's story, Deji's story, uh, Adafe's story, 
and all of the people who have like inspired us. Um, I think you're going to continue to inspire the world. And uh, we have been working very hard uh, with uh, Michael and people all over the globe to help support this movement, protect you in this movement, and continue to be here with you through this movement. And so uh, it's an incredibly courageous thing. And, you know, we made this film from the bottom of our hearts. We've been working on it for almost <laughs> three years now, every single day, day in and day out. And so we hope and pray that this turns around and that in the long term, it creates positive change. It creates more opportunities uh, to make money and careers and be able to like be thriving instead of just trying to survive. My hope is for thriving and not surviving. And that's what you all can do. Thank you so much for allowing me to be part of this conversation. If you're watching, please follow HBO to learn how you can support the organizations that are creating the spaces for movement. Michael, James, such an honor to have you as part of this conversation. And congrats once again, Giselle and Neka, for such an incredibly powerful film. Uh, on behalf of Rainbow Railroad and our community of supporters, thank you for allowing me to moderate this conversation and have a wonderful day. Bye.